which is often known for campaigning to right wrongs for consumer after the event. In this case, what we're doing is campaigning to prevent any consumer detriment in the future. That's not to say that we're not really excited by the potential of these new technologies. There are potentially huge benefits to consumers from nanotechnologies. However, we are concerned that research keeps pace with development to make sure that consumers are safe, and we want to know that consumers voice, the consumer's voice is heard and listened to as policy is developed along these lines. First of all, I think it's clear that nanotechnologies offer many benefits for consumers. As we've heard, it's everything from self-cleaning windows, more effective cancer drugs, a whole range of different applications in between. But one of the things that concerns us is that there are a lot of questions being raised about the implications for the environment and health that aren't being properly answered. Many products are coming onto the market, as we've heard, there's some outside, but there's a whole range of different products. But the difficulty is, you can't see where these products are. People don't know what's happening, and even the government hasn't got a clear idea about the extent to which nano products are available and what could be coming along in the future. Two or three years ago, uh, the government decided we ought to know a damn sight more about this and commissioned uh, the engineers and the Royal Society to do a really, really good report uh, and public consultation on nanotechnology, after which, uh, and I use the word which advisedly in this sense, which feels not a lot has happened. We're concerned about the government's lack of progress. We're not keeping pace with the developments. We appear to be going round in circles. We want to see the government taking much more action to make sure that the public is properly protected. It was all very well back what they did in 2004. We seem to have taken our eye off the ball. Uh, let's remind ourselves we're not talking about things that are entirely novel. Um, we had viruses before anybody realized what nanotechnology, what nanoparticles were. We've had soot. There's nothing phenomenally new uh, in, in this. And incidentally, let's not all get our knickers in a twist about words like natural or unnatural. Uh, things like arsenic, uh, which are natural, can be very dangerous indeed. And things which are unnatural can be perfectly good for us. And yes, maybe we can make little robots eventually that are going to be at virus size running around our bodies, uh, doing all sorts of magical things, uh, surgery in heaven knows what. Maybe it's going to be much more akin to biology than it is to uh, engineering. Uh, maybe there are all sorts of wonderful things out there, but as Helen says, there are an awful lot of questions as well that we really need to pose. Uh, given the dangers of things like uh, MMR, where the public was misinformed about things, given the dangers of GM, where the public was uninformed about things, where there simply wasn't enough forethought, should we be doing a hell of a lot more than we're doing at the moment? Let me explain today what the government is doing and then let's have a debate about whether we're doing enough and whether there's more that needs to be done. And we have in this room today a number of experts in the subject of nanotechnology that I think that we can sort of build a consensus about if there are gaps, where there are gaps, who needs to plug those gaps, how do we best uh, deliver that. Our ability to facilitate genuine public dialogue and debate I think will be a measure of our success. And today, I'd like to confirm our commitment to keep nanotechnology as a government priority. And I agree totally with which. Innovation cannot succeed without an appropriate regulatory framework to deal with risks. And that's why we've set up a ministerial group to maintain momentum and to ensure that we look at the whole picture, the health, safety, environmental impacts, as well as the economic and societal benefits. The work to, to date has really concentrated either on the kind of the white goods area or into fringes of the cosmetics area. It will be interesting to see if we do go further into things like food and food packaging going forward. If we can get lighter materials, that saves energy. Um, if we can get, uh, if we can minimise waste, that's enormously important also. Using nanotechnology to make cheap, large area solar cells is really very important. Purifying drinking water, particularly relevant in the third world. Better targeting of drugs has been mentioned, faster diagnosis. Some of the specialist um, clothing examples, uh, sports equipment, for example, that we've seen out there now, will become more affordable and more accessible for all consumers. So we have a whole 
raft of legislation that applies to what can be placed on the market, what can be manufactured, imported, or placed on the market. So it's quite clear, it says in law, you can't put a cosmetic on the market if it poses a risk. The question is, do we enough of know, know enough about nano to know what those risks are? So the key issue is, have we got the science to address the hazards and risks, and what can we do to get that in place? Any solution in this area will have probably to be done at a European level than at a national level. The Royal Society's and Royal Academy of Engineering's 2004 study concluded that most nanotechnologies posed no new risks. There are, however, different types of risk. If nanotechnologies are seen as being um, an area of great uncertainty, entrepreneurs, researchers in universities won't be able to get money from venture capitalists to spin out um, great ideas that come from the lab that will lead to benefits, that will help us address these grand challenges. It's really important that products and potential products are tested throughout their entire life cycle. And one initiative that we're involved in is the development of the responsible nanocode. So it is very important that we keep in balance the hype and the hope, and that we try and bound ourselves into what is realistic. You know, I find it really frustrating because it, it, this is an issue that's not actually a very big issue in my view. It's, it, you know, it is engineered nanoparticles that, uh, uh, that, that, that are the, the difficulty, not, not the other things. And it, it, it really could have been sorted out a long time ago and I feel very depressed that it wasn't. We, we, we need the knowledge. I think that, you know, that that's the point that John's made and is, is, is exactly right. I mean, the regular... The regulation has to follow the knowledge. The knowledge doesn't arise until you do the research. You have to make sure the research is done. What, what, what would you say? Well, I mean, to be frank, you know, the Royal Society in 2004 said we ought to spend £10 million on a dedicated centre for nanotoxicological right. studies. They didn't do it. Had they done it, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Okay. For most people, we get our views about what the world through a lens that is supplied by the media. It, it's inevitable. We can't all be experts and face-to-face -face with everything. How do we engage the media? Uh, I think unless we get a consistent reasoned message through the media, we could be in some trouble with this um, because there is always um, a temptation to sensationalize the story. And actually, I think that could work both ways. It's not necessarily always got to be about the risk. It could be about the hype, for example. Now, we're quite interested that the products that we sell are real added value for customers. They do deliver what they say because that's the only way you can run a sustainable retail operation. I, I represent the cosmetics industry. Um, I run the trade association. And obviously, the first reaction the media um, would give to anything I say is you would say that, wouldn't you? The companies pay you. Um, I can only say that building trust is a long, long, slow process. Yes, my name is Hilary Sutcliffe from Responsible Futures. Um, I've been um, given some, very kindly given some cash by the government to do a consultation which considers how we take forward a strategic public engagement, stakeholder engagement process, how we communicate with the general public. They want an honest broker to, to, to facilitate that debate, not necessarily for, for the BRC to do it, not necessarily for government to do it, but for an independent, perhaps multi-stakeholder body to, to hold the sort of the public good in mind. I think part of the consensus that's come out of this is that we need an honest broker like which to take this on in the future. I just reflect that the things that I've heard are urgency, excitement and frustration in equal measure. Um, and overall, the need for much more joining up in terms of dialogue and much more joining up in terms of action. Um, and I think what Witch is really concerned to do here is to keep up the pace on this now. Um, so it is a challenge, which is not planning to do it all by itself, but it is planning to act as a sort of catalyst and a drive for trying to take this debate forward. Uh, and I think one of the positive things to come out of the, the discussion and the fact that the minister was here and so on this morning, has committed to listening to us, we have committed to going back and responding to the ministerial statement, to holding another meeting and so forth, uh, to try to fill, to, or try to get some pace injected into filling some of these gaps. Because just like nanotechnologies itself, scoping, this, so the, the, scoping the area, research in the area, even consumer engagement in the area is not new. <laughs> what it isn't quite yet is landed, joined up, attached to policy making in the way that we'd like to see it.